Good morning. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks a lot for spending your early part of your afternoon on a perfectly serviceable Friday with, uh, <laughs> with me. Um, so today we're going to be talking about writing effective proposals for fellowships and grants. And I'm going to co cover both fellowships and grants. And there are a lot of similarities. There are some differences, too. And I'll talk about those uh, as we go along. Um, my name, those of you whom I haven't met, I'm Darren Lapomi. I'm a professor in nano and chemical engineering and also associate dean for students in the Jacobs School of Engineering at UC San Diego. All right. so. What are we going to talk about? So, what is a research proposal? A research proposal is the vehicle by which you communicate with an audience your idea and why it should be funded. What is the importance of writing a compelling research proposal? The reason that we write is because we can't plug into the reviewer's brain directly. The writing process, the process of making figures, is this thing that takes a hundred hours to do when eventually we will hopefully just be able to make some kind of a neural link to the people and they will automatically appreciate why our ideas are the best and deserve funding. Um, unfortunately, committees can't do that yet. So you need to do this process of, of writing using language and figures and so on. One time I was at a grant writing workshop put on by the NIH, uh, National Institutes of Health, and one of the program managers said that there are many more bad proposals than bad project ideas, and that good ideas get obscured behind bad prose and bad arguments to figures that can't be discerned. To the extent to which that's true and the extent to which he was just trying to be nice <laughs> to the audience of, uh, of NIH awardees. I'm not sure. Um, I have my own opinions on that, but I'll get to you in a little bit. So what are we talking about in terms of grants versus fellowships? So graduate students, um, how many are grad students in the audience? How many postdocs? OK, so a grad fellowship is more like judging you and your academic achievements and slightly a little bit less on the actual research proposal itself, for better or worse, at the postdoc level. So those of you who are grad students will be going on into a postdoc. Um, or even if you're doing a company and you're applying for a grant like an SBIR or STTR grant, um, for, for small company, small business innovation research, or small tech transfer or something or other, I forgot what STTR stands for, um, but you'll be doing this process as well. And even if you work at a big company, you will always, there will always be uh, reasons for you to write up your results for getting um, more uh, resources. So this is relevant whether you go into academia or not. Um, at the postdoc level, a research fellowship is much more like a grant. So take the NIH F32 award, which is a postdoc fellowship that is basically a grant given to the university to which the postdoc applies, but the PI of the fellowship is the postdoc, and it is written exactly like a grant would be written. A grant proposal, although we can't plug directly into the brains of the reviewers or the program manager or the scientific review officer, is a psychology experiment. It's a psychology experiment. You have to begin the process of writing a grant proposal with faith. The faith that that blank computer screen that blank document can be chiseled away with your writing in such a way to reveal a project proposal that can be funded and will be funded. Much like this is attributed to Michelangelo, 
the uh, famous Italian artist that before making a, a sculpture like the David statue or the Pieta statue, that he envisioned that this block of solid marble already had that sculpture in place. All he needed to do was remove the unneeded bits. So you have to have faith that that blank piece of paper, or blank document on your screen, has a winning proposal in it. What is the life cycle of a research proposal? A research proposal, one time, uh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this is, that this be how you approach research proposals, but one time, I was, uh, for about 10 years of my life, I was totally uncaffeinated. And the reason is because in grad school, I spilled acid on my face, and I went to the emergency room for chemical burns, and they told me that uh, my blood pressure and pulse were out of control because I was drinking like two pints of coffee every morning. And uh, then I did 23andMe, and it said that I had a poor caffeine intolerance, or poor, poor caffeine tolerance, and, uh, and to reduce my caffeine intake. And one day in 2014, it was the summer, and I was walking around here in the bare courtyard, out, just right outside here, and I, uh, and I got a fully caffeinated latte because I had no anxiety-inducing meetings on my schedule that day. And I was so wired, and I said, what can I apply for? So I saw the solicitation for the NIH Director's New Innovator Award, which is one of the few grants that an engineer can apply to without having preliminary data, at least in the NIH portfolio. And so I outlined the whole thing, like totally on this latte trip, and I was, I actually, it ended up being funded, and that completely changed the trajectory of my uh, career. So I'm not saying that, um, how, you know, how, you begin a research proposal by, uh, by um, you know, consuming large amounts of caffeine, although that may work for some people. But a more reliable way to do it is to take notes at all times. So always have a place to take notes. I often take notes in terms of voice memos, not voice memos that I listen to, but voice memos, voice to text memos. I actually use a dictation app for that um, called Dragon Anywhere. Um, I compose emails to myself all the time. Wouldn't it be cool if you could, uh, you could use some kind of skin cream so that it was possible to feel like as tactile stimulus. Um, so there are a lot of ways that you might want to, uh, want to do this. But as early as possible in the, pro in, the in the process, look at agencies. So that's NSF, NIH, um, other countries and uh, different institutions like NSERC in Canada and European Research Council and so forth. Um, different uh, companies have research solicitations too, like Samsung, LG, I've reviewed for those before, and list what has been funded. If you can find out, um, if it's a US-based agency, they'll have a, like a map or a list of where all the stuff, all the funding came from, or where all the funding went, and you can see if those project titles and abstracts match the flavor of what you are trying to do. So I'm a big believer in the idea of marinating in an idea. So to give you an example, I get a lot of requests to review papers from journals. And I know that I don't have time to do the review right now when I get the, the invitation. But I'll look at it. I'll open up the paper and just kind of scan through it. And even if I don't do, even if I don't revisit it to write the referee report for another week or so, I feel like that one initial period where I have taken that information in is actually useful in something in the back of my mind, like churns away on it. And then when you see it again, you're not seeing it for the first time and you approach it in a different light, it creates buckets in your mind. So as early as possible, before you've made any figures, before you decided what your preliminary data is going to be, have the agency in mind. 
Like, look at that list. Uh, Cross-reference it with your idea. See how you might be able to tailor that idea to that particular program. Also, use this time uh, well in advance of submission or writing to socialize your idea with colleagues. That is subjected to conversational pressure because you can get a lot of free consulting from your lab mates, from your PI, and where you say, I'm thinking of, about this, and they'll say, well, did you consider this and this and this criticism? And like, no, maybe I didn't. Maybe I, I should alter my approach in some way. Because when starting out, like even now, even after 11 years as a PI, nine out of 10 of my ideas are crap. And the goal is to reduce that, <laughs> that number. Um, and you do that by getting the, by internalizing the feedback of others because they will approach your idea from a different perspective. And you want to be able to, uh, to narrow down what is a, what is a a uh, robust idea where you can run good controls, where you can uh, you can know um, you know what has been done in the literature already, because that's what people that's what your colleagues are really good for too, is knowing like no, so and so did that already, or so and so did that already. You might want to see what the pitfalls are, and don't get embarrassed by doing this. People people like to have their brain picked about ideas, also because. Also, when you have your own brain picked by somebody else, you like to be able to like show off a little bit and ask like those pointed questions, like, um, "Are you, did you know why why would somebody use that device or like this company the company is doing this or this research lab is doing it already?" Find a day uh, or a, a week where you have a full few blocks of time to work on your ideas and carve them out, like this is once we start getting in the, prepar in the writing preparation stage. And my suggestion is once you have your idea notebook or your voice memos or your the dictation or notes that you've taken from conversations, write down everything. Just write down little phrases, because sometimes a little phrase that you write down or that you think of can actually trigger a whole avalanche of, of like it can trigger a whole paragraph or a whole section of the graph. Like, how would I elaborate on this one particular idea I had for this uh, proposal? It's not necessary to write a complete outline at this point. So a lot of times, when I do section headings, so my, my advisor was, uh, was, um, was my advisor, still alive, still is a person, um, uh, George Whitesides, um, who was known for microfluidics and self-assembly and stuff, he would say, um, outline everything, write down your intro approach, uh, experimental design, um, results and discussion conclusions and put in all the subheadings. What I found though is that I started to write prose and then I'd have to make huge changes afterwards when I realized that the details of the prose didn't match the outline that I came up with before. So don't, don't, you don't have to do this quite yet. Um, sometimes we use the idea of outlining as sort of an excuse to avoid the hard work of actually forming our, our arguments. So go ahead and just write as fast as you can. Use any, um, it just, and by fast I mean not just for the sake of fast, but so that you don't forget stuff that you wanted to put in there. Don't worry about the way that sentences are crafted at the beginning. It's fine if they're 50 words long and you use all kinds of jargon at the beginning. That's fine, you can refine it later. This is also the time when you find collaborators to fill in holes. Maybe your PI can help you fill in, uh, fill in holes, like I need a computation expert, I need a bioinformatician expert, I need a mechanics expert, I need a chemist, I need human subjects uh, person, I need animal facilities. Who are you going to go to 
to have access to those resources, and that's it. And you need to ask these people early. Work on the figures with a, your draft text as a guide, and then finalize your figures later. Then finalize the text, and, uh, and at that point you're finalizing the figures. Now the second half of the life cycle of a research proposal is when it's out of your hands. So you submit the research proposal, and you have a beer or a sparkling water, and then you wait three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine months for news. <laughs> because it takes forever for stuff to get reviewed. Um, even though, oddly, when you review for one of these agencies, they demand your stuff in three weeks. <laughs> um, and then so you, often you don't have actual funding for up to a year. Um, so what does the review process look like? So the program manager is the scientific manager of that particular realm of science in the agency to which you submit. The program manager may or may not be the same person as the scientific review officer. That is the person that handles the peer review process. At NSF, they are the same person. At NIH, they are different people. And I'm sure there's a joke in there about like law and order um, where the narrator says, the, in the grant review system, the grants are judged by two equal but separate <laughs> organizations. And so there's this whole scientific review office, uh, office that organizes the study sections, they're called. This is all for NIH. And then they send those reviews back to the program manager that is in National Cancer Institute, National Institute for General Medical Sciences, um, National Institute for Bioimaging and Biomedical Engineering, what have you. There are like 20-some you know, institutes within NIH. And then, based on the scores, the program makes, uh, makes a decision on funding. Who is on the review committee? They are peers that ostensibly, or that nominally, are from your field, or the field of research of your proposal. Um, they are called, it's sometimes called an, an ad hoc uh, review meeting, so, or committee, so in NSF, usually these committees are formed and dissolved with every batch of proposals that comes in. So the same people are not necessarily on it every time. At NIH, maybe around half of the people serve a four-year term. Those are called stand, um, standing members of the study section. Then there are temporary members of the study section that rotate in and out. Maybe they'll do one or two in a row, and maybe, or maybe one a year or something like that, um, and maybe one only ever. In an NIH proposal, you get, to, you get to recommend that a certain institute look at your proposal, like NCI, National Cancer Institute, and you can also suggest what study section read it, like cellular and molecular technologies, or instrumentation and systems development, thinking about ones that tend to apply to engineers. They don't have to take your suggestion, but it's it helps them to provide a suggestion. Okay, you want to you want to think about writing to generate champions on the uh, on the panel. So if you can speak to a couple of people, speak to the to your peers on the on the committee, then when the panel gets together. In, in, in most cases, they will get together. They generally don't get together if you apply to DOD funding. Um, usually those are all done by, by email. Um, uh, at NIH and NSF, they're us usually done with a discussion, depending on the stage of, uh, of, the, of the process. 
And if you have, um, if you can convince a couple of people in a really strong way to convince the panel that this is a strong proposal, then you can kind of leverage their voice. Um, now, how do you do this in practice? Well, you write a, an effective proposal that doesn't, at least doesn't offend anyone, <laughs> right? I'll talk more about that in a moment. So even, even so, scores usually end up being averages. So in the NSF system, you have poor, fair, good, excellent, or good, very good, excellent. And usually it's kind of an average of those. In, N in NIH land, uh, what you do is you have three reviewers, and then they review the proposals ahead of time. Um, and then they go into a room, either on Zoom or in person, where there are 20-some people in this room, and only three, and they review 100 proposals or 80 proposals. The, um, the top half are discussed, and the bottom half are dreaded, you get a dreaded ND, or not discussed. And then those 50 that, are, that remain, the three people that actually read the proposal are like the lawyers arguing the case for or against that proposal, or uh, mediocrely <laughs> uh, uh, with respect to their attitude on the proposal. And then they convince the rest of the, uh, the jury, basically, the rest of the study section, and, uh, and in the end, everyone votes with a number. They provide a number one to nine, one being the best, nine being the worst. Then you take an average of that number, you multiply it by 10, and that's the NIH score. So scores of like 30 and below are good, are you know really solid. In general, those will get funded, in general, in general. Um, so it's almost like, and, and if there's an expert in the room, who did not read the proposal, but can ask questions to the reviewers who have become experts in those proposals, they behave like the, like the, like the jury, except the jury can ask questions. Okay, so then the scientific evaluation is sent to the program manager who makes the final funding decision. In NSF, it's a very similar process, except that the scientific review officer is, if he's in the room at the time of the scientific review, is the same person who makes the funding decision. At NIH, all that stuff gets written up and then sent to a person who is not in the room and they make the funding decision. Department of Defense, a lot of that process is behind a, uh, a closed door. Um, it's hard to get an idea of what happens there. I know from being part of the process that proposals are sent to out for peer review, but the program manager has much more control over the content of their portfolio um, than, if not nominally, then in practice, than do program managers in the other agencies. Next, getting into the mind of the reviewer. Um, first of all, you want to make sure that you're aligning the proposal with the funder's objectives. The program manager in particular is the first and last person that needs to be convinced, whether this is NSF or NIH or DOE, Department of Energy or DOD. I have to restrict it to um, U.S. agencies because those are the ones that I know the most about. I know that other countries have similar systems for when uh, some of you will be applying. Uh, to grants in other countries. Reviewers generally have good intentions, but all have biases. They have biases based on their scientific training. They have biases based on knowledge or lack of knowledge about your institution. They have biases because you may or may not have smiled at them once at a conference. They have biases related to all kinds of, uh, of, of other characteristics that, uh, that 
may or may not paint them in the best light. None will be an expert in everything in your proposal. You are the world's biggest expert in your proposal. If someone else is a bigger expert in your proposal, I would find another topic to write a proposal on. All of them know something about statistics, experimental design. Okay, I'm going to go back because that that could be uh, that could be mis misconstrued, and I also don't entirely agree with it every time. None will be an expert in everything in your proposal. There will be aspects. Your proposal will be better if you can draw from some aspect of your training or experience that someone else reading it is not likely to have. Because they will see that as, oh, that's a, new, that's a new angle. I think we could learn something about the system that we wouldn't be able to learn without that kind of expertise. However, even though not everyone is a topic expert, all the reviewers will know something about statistics, experimental design, how the likelihood of, of success matches with the convincingness of the preliminary data. However, not all grant mechanisms require preliminary data, and if you have preliminary data and those that don't want it, then your proposal will get desk rejected. So make sure you look at the program's uh, solicitation and see what constitutes preliminary data. Is it a figure? Is it something unpublished? Is it something published? Sometimes it's helpful to hedge and say, don't call it preliminary data, call it proof of concept work. <laughs> or you call it uh, foundational observations. <laughs> um, don't, don't give them reason to make it Give them reasonable doubt. <laughs> Criticism usually results from omission of facts, not from factual errors. You can be pretty sure that what you put on there, what you write, is going to be correct. You don't, I mean, we're all here, we're all PhD students or postdocs, um, or professors, and we are really, really, at the very least, trying not to be wrong about stuff that we say, right? So we're pretty sure that most of the stuff we say is factually correct. And when, it's, when we don't know if it's factually correct, that forms part of the hypothesis, or why you're doing the research to begin with. We want to see if this is, if this is the mechanism for such and such or if such, an, if such a device can be accomplished using this particular approach. However, when you're leaving stuff out, that's when reviewers pounce. So you leave out the statistical analysis. You leave out why you need this number of animals in your study, why you need this many replicates, Statistics, that's the, like the, that's the soft underbelly <laughs> of many proposals. Um, if the type of measurement you're proposing, say it's x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, doesn't match, doesn't give you the kind of information that, you, that you're saying that it will, they'll pounce on, on, on that um, because you've, you've left out the experiment that you need to, uh, to prove your hypothesis. Or this kind of, um, or say you, you are writing, you're doing some kind of computer vision task or something, and there's some algorithm that some researcher has developed and you didn't know about it, or worse, you knew about it and didn't cite it. Um, those kinds of omissions, those are the, the unforgivable ones. Where if you accumulate a couple of those errors, forget about it. But for the most part, they will believe what you tell them. First, do no harm. This is what they 
teach doctors. Um, don't say anything, don't write anything that could be construed as arrogant or combative. Like, a massive hole in the literature is <laughs> such and such. Or, these other researchers failed to account for blah 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 because one of those other researchers might be reading your proposal. Or maybe that researcher smiled at the person at a conference reading your proposal. Anticipate the concerns that a reviewer might have. Have a section explicitly on pitfalls and alternative strategies. And this isn't a suggestion. If you don't have this, you will get hammered by at least one of the reviewers. You know why? Because reviewers have, they're busy, and they've banked these criticisms in their minds. And it's a bit like one of those child's toys, where you pull the string, and the arrow goes around, and it goes, it lands on the cow, and it goes, the cow says, oh. And it's like you pull the chain on the reviewer, and it goes, the, the PI did not include anything about biostatistics. Pull the chain. There's no pitfalls section. The PI and the co-PI are located more than 100 miles away from each other. How do we know that they can get in contact? So there are the same criticisms that are used over and over and over again. Make sure that you explicitly address any program-specific criteria. In NIH, and I, sorry, I keep bringing it back to NIH, I know because I'm talking in the bioengineering building, but um, there are the five major review criteria, significance, innovation, approach, investigators, and environment. In NSF, we call this, uh, the two primary criteria are intellectual merit and broader impacts. Those are quite a bit less specific, but same kind of idea. Make sure you use those, those words. Strategies to make the proposal reader friendly. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but make sure that your writing is coherent. And I don't mean that like, you know, when you're about to fall asleep and you say something that's incoherent or you think something that's incoherent. I mean, one section should logically follow into the next. Uh, one paragraph goes into the next. One sentence goes into the next. Anticipate questions and answer them as you go. Try to get into the mind of the reader. How do you navigate multiple agencies and programs? There are a lot of idiosyncrasies of programs. So NSF, the buzzword is transformative, transformative potential of this research. NSF can tend to be more high risk, high reward. Um, the money outside of a few directorates and programs is not really that high. If you apply in biological sciences, they tend to be more competitive with NIH, but at the in engineering directorate, it's definitely not. Sorry. Uh, uh, NIH, like I said, it has 20-ish institutes and program and, and uh, institutes and centers, or ICs. And then you also have this other structure, the scientific review uh, uh, office. You have the Department of Defense, which some famous members are Air Force Office of Scientific Research, AFOSR, Office of Navy Re Research, ONR, Army Research Office, A ARO, and also you have the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, which is Department of Defense but has a different funding structure. It's very much milestone driven. Um, and it's a lot of money, but the, the, there are a lot of um, milestones that have, to be, that have to be reached. Department of Energy has multiple offices, like Solar Energy Technologies Office, uh, CEDO. Um, it also has like Basic Energy Sciences, BES, and so on. You also have the DARPA equivalent in DOE called ARPA-E, ARPA Energy. There are a few different dichotomies that you have to navigate. And these, where you are on these one-dimensional uh, spectra will depend on what 
type of agency and program within that agency and even solicitation within that program you're responding to. So there's basic on one hand versus applied on the other. There's low risk on one hand versus high risk on the other. Now, no one ever brags about doing a low risk proposal, right? But the, the R01 mechanism in, NS, in NIH, which is the primary sort of the, the lifeblood of NIH funded researchers, those uh, proposals have to have a high success rate. Like you have to have all your ducks in a row you have to be pretty sure that what you have is going to work based on your preliminary data. Right now they call it the rigor. They changed the word from preliminary data to rigor of previous results or something like that. Use the word rigor. Um, and then, uh, but then there's also like the transformative R01, transformative research award, which is in the office of the director, which is high risk and you don't include preliminary data in that mechanism. Then you have incremental versus transformative, similar to low risk versus high risk, but not necessarily. You could have a transformative idea that was also low risk. What are some differences between agencies in terms of the application process? So look at due dates even within one agency, like National Science Foundation. Um, engineering directorate a few years ago changed its policy where it didn't have specific dates. It said it was rolling acceptance of proposals all year. The catch is once you submit a proposal, you have to wait another year before you can submit it again. Whereas in principle, if your next due date came six months later for a different agency, say DMR, Division of Materials Research, and then, then, then you had all your comments back and stuff, then you could address them and resubmit it within the same year, which isn't very likely because that would require a super fast turnaround, um, but it's in principle possible. There are also some idiosyncrasies about when or if you should reach out to the program manager. So I have historically always gotten this wrong. <laughs> Uh, when I was an assistant professor, one time I went to the program, program officer at, at NSF and I had already submitted a proposal, but I was in Washington, D.C. for another reason. And I asked if I could meet. And we had a nice discussion. I asked, um, asked about various uh, uh, program priorities and so on. And then the next day, the program, the proposal I had submitted like a week earlier showed up in the guy's inbox and he called me on the phone and said this was was uh, so dishonest of, of you I thought I might have given you I, I would have been more guarded in what I said but the reason I didn't ask anything about the proposal I just asked about the program was be, was because of that because I didn't because I didn't want to think well I already submitted it now there's nothing I can do right so I had a very general conversation the program manager was very upset about it it ruined totally ruined my day um, in another instance uh, working with a uh, with somebody in another. Uh, agency, I won't say what it is because it would narrow them down way too much, um, they said, this is like three months before I submitted a, before the due date for this particular proposal, and the program manager said, I can't meet with you when you come to Washington, D.C. because you haven't submitted the proposal yet, and I fear that I would give you an unfair advantage completely the opposite guidance. So, there is no, uh, so I guess what I could say is talk to the person a year ahead of time and then you'll be safe. Then you'll be safe. Um, in some cases, a program manager will discourage you from submitting it to their program. Okay. So you don't submit your proposal to their program because they, they know how, pro, how proposals tend to do on certain topics in their program. 
But beware of cases where the program manager tries to tell you how your, your proposal would, would be perceived in other programs. One time I had a program manager um, who turned down a proposal and said that they shopped it around to a bunch of other programs and no one was willing to take it. No one, would, no, no one said that it would be a good fit for the program. But I had already written it and I submitted it to another program anyway. And it got funded. Not only did it get funded, but it broke my long losing streak at, at, uh, at NSF of 11 proposals rejected in a row between 2014 and 2019. So sometimes you have to take the information you get with a grain of salt. There will be eligibility criteria for different programs that you really, really have to keep in, keep in the back of your mind, keep in the front of your mind. Does your project involve humans? If it involves humans, is it nearly human subject research or does it qualify as a clinical trial? Now what's the difference? A clinical trial studies the effect of a proposed intervention. Intervention is the key word. Are there animals involved? Is your IACUC protocol all set? Is there foreign involvement? Um, are you shipping samples to another country? How do you find the right program solicitation? Well, it's a, it's a mess out there. And I didn't, uh, I didn't learn this till very far into my, my program. And nobody told me what I'm telling you right now. So within each agency, there's something like a directorate, then there's something like a division, divisions within that directorate, and then there's a program. For example, the agency might be NSF, the directorate might be engineering, the division might be CBET, which is chemical, biological, environmental, transport. I don't know why those particularly get grouped together, but there it is. And then the program might be disability and rehabilitation engineering. Sometimes programs are coded to correspond to different fields, and you might not be aware of this the first time you look. CMMI is, um, I'm totally going to get this wrong, but uh, manufacturing mechanical innovation, something like, something like that. It's basically where civil engineers and mechanical engineers send their, their stuff. Now there's a biomechanics and mechanobiology program within CMMI, and okay, so there's some overlap with bioengineering and uh, some other fields. CBET, chemical and bioengineering, environmental engineering, transport phenomena, anything that involves heat, <laughs> heat and mass transport. And you could go on and on. ECCS is the ECE. I forgot what the one for, uh, for CSE is. Uh, it has a C in it for computers. <laughs> um, what's important is that although you might look at that solicitation and say, oh, my idea fits into these words, I could see how it could be construed, but it can fit into those fields. But the reviewers that those program managers select might not be in your field, it might be quite far off, it might furthermore be like offended that an outsider applied to their pot of money that's reserved for their field. This is kind of like the hidden curriculum of obtaining funding. So everyone's heard of NSF, NIH, DOE, DOD, but then that's the tip of the iceberg. There's all this other stuff under there. Venture outside your field at your own risk. So you're, if you want to apply for something outside of your field, make sure your language or jargon is impeccable. And they will hear that you don't have the same scientific accent that they have. They'll say, no, that's not a, an afferent, that's a mechanosensory corpuscle. Or whatever. Like, no, that neuron doesn't terminate in the dorsal horn, it terminates in the dorsal root ganglion. 
Okay, those would be factual errors, but you get the point. There are other ways of speaking a, a language where you're not quite using the language the way a professional in that field would. So if you go outside your area, make sure that somebody who really knows goes through your language and make, it, make sure you're, you're using it right. How to address specific solicitation requirements in your proposal. If they bothered to put it in the solicitation, you have to address it. So, no clinical trials. So if you do something that looks like an intervention, it'll get desk rejected. Coming up with novel ideas. I guess this is like the core of the whole thing, right? Have all the good ideas been taken? I personally don't think they have been. Uh, how do you find new ideas? I think the best way is to look between fields that don't often talk to each other. So all my best collaborations right now are with, so I'm an organic material scientist, engineer, organic material scientist, engineer, whatever. Um, you can see I think a lot of the boundary between science and engineering anyway. Um, so my most profitable collaborations have been with psychologists, neurobiologists, behavioral scientists, um, and the reason is, if you can make an effort to speak their language a little bit, and you can meet them halfway, think about them as islands in the ocean. And there's that big blue ocean in the middle between these areas of learning where there's all that knowledge to be created. And the farther apart you are, the more information, the more knowledge there is to be created in the middle. That's one, one way. Another way is to look at the intersections of your interests. So it's pretty improbable that any one of us is the best bioengineer, the best structural engineer, the best computer scientist, the best mechanical engineer, best chemical, whatever. But I would be willing to bet that every single person in this room is the best at some product of three or more capabilities. What do I mean by that? If I look at my skills as, chem as a chemist, so my undergraduate degree is in chemistry, so maybe I, I like, maybe I know, maybe I'm in the top 10% of scientists that would know something about organic chemistry. Okay, I'm burnishing my credentials a little bit too much. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm in the top 30%. <laughs> um, let's just say one in 10. Then I'm one in five at somebody that knows of somebody that knows something about uh, mechanics. So now I'm one in ten times one in five, so I'm one in fifty. Now I'm starting to look pretty good. Now I'm one in two at somebody that knows something about psychology. Now I'm one in a hundred. And what if I I'm not a computer scientist, but what if I spent a lot of time as a kid, like, coding? What if I have another factor of two in there? I'm one in 200. And you start doing this, and if you start combining, finding a way to dovetail these disparate interests and experiences, then by definition, it doesn't take many of these skills to be the absolute best at something that occurs at the intersection between these skill sets. How do you put the pieces of the puzzle together for a research proposal? Go to conferences, even if you're not presenting, even if there's no money in your PI's budget, it will repay the investment even if you just go. I mean, it sucks if your PI is not going to pay, but the, or they don't have the money to pay, but it is the premium that you will get on your, your lifetime earnings potential by getting this in, by having this experience, working on these ideas earlier rather than later. It's like compound interest. Like having a penny and doubling it every day for a month, and at the end of the month, you have a million dollars. Talk to a lot of people. Try to get sleep. Easier said than done. 
take walks, write stuff down. How to distinguish between incremental and transformative research ideas. Um, same things as above. Talk to, talk to colleagues. Um, talk to lab mates. Conversational pressure. Ask your colleagues for examples. Ask your classmates for examples. Ask your PI for examples of funded research proposals. Oftentimes they'll give it to you. I've, I, I have a Dropbox that I've shared with a bunch of people that has every version of a funded proposal. I'm going to post this video publicly and I, I'll probably get like a hundred requests for share access to that Dropbox. <laughs> Um, demonstrating the feasibility of innovative con uh, concepts. We've talked about this um, kind of already. I'm repeating myself a bit. But sometimes feasibility is not really necessary in a high risk, high reward. How do you demonstrate your uniqueness? Why are you the right person for this research? So take your experiences and kind of focus them in on this particular problem. People will believe what you say, but you have to give examples. So like, I'm really good at math. <laughs> so show, cite something that shows like how you model this or that. You came up with some analytical or numerical solution to some problem. Showing a strong track record and relevant research, that's, that's key. Unless it's something that involves a pivot, so the F32, for example, a lot of you will be applying to an F32-like like thing. That's the NIH postdoc fellowship. They want to see a pivot. If your work is too close to what you already did, it, it'll get dinged. And basically talked about that already. Resources just show that the place you're preparing to go to or the place you are now has the resources like equipment. Um, how do you know? How, do, how is the reviewer going to know that UCSD has an N NMR? <laughs> no. Um, letters, evidence, uh, you know, say what building it's in. That makes it real in the person's mind. Um, usually there's a separate document for that, so it doesn't count against your page limit. Ways to demonstrate your access to the necessary equipment, especially if it's not on campus. Highlighting collaborations that have provided access to additional resources. Um, so publishing papers together with an international collaborator or a collaborator in Ohio or Pennsylvania or someplace far away from San Diego. Um, having a track record of publishing together is important. Right. A few tips on writing clearly and concisely. If you're interested, I have stuff on my YouTube channel about this. Multiple uh, hours of videos on how to write concisely and clearly. Um, avoid excessive hedging. So, in most cases, this will probably, generally speaking, do this, I think. Um, people will give you some leeway there. Academies. Academies is like really long sentences, like sentences more than 20 words. Academies involves excessively long words, like stick to three syllables or less. I'm not kidding. Stick to two or less where possible. <laughs> um, got as opposed to receive. <laughs> only, only sorry, kidding. Um, signposting, so avoid like, first I'm going to tell you this, then I'm going to tell you this. If your writing is coherent enough, it'll be obvious. Use short words and sentences. Jargon doesn't make you sound smart. It makes the reader feel dumb. Avoid redundant information. Uh, Ports of logical flow of ideas and coherence. So critically, each paragraph has to start with a topic sentence that has the beginnings of an argument, not just a title. So chemical libraries are used often in screening for agonists for cell surface proteins. Okay, that's a title, that's a statement, but if there's no torque in it, there's no reason why somebody should, consider, could, should continue reading that paragraph. Say something about combinatorial libraries and screening for small molecules. Each paragraph has to end with a sentence that begs the next one. 
So set up a little bit of uncertainty, unless it's the last, well, no, even if it is the last paragraph of the entire paper. Make the reader want to continue. Each sentence ends with the heaviest or most important information or the longest element of a list. Read the proposal out loud. If you get out of breath or not delighted by the exactitude of every sentence, rewrite it. Because there is a lot of like cognitive load involved in processing long sentences. Figures. All proposals, I'm running out of time, so I'll go fast. All proposals have to have figures, a nice figure overview that ties everything together, like a graphical abstract on the first page or as early as possible that gives you the whole idea of the whole fellowship or grant proposal all at once is awesome. Start on the figures early, use simple color schemes like the Google colors. Um, or use, you know, some other color scheme, but be consistent. The font size must be absurdly large in Illustrator, PowerPoint, etc., so that it still looks good when it shrunk down to three inches. Crop out the native scale bars on a microscope. Use a sans serif font, um, because if you write it in all Times New Roman, it looks like it was written in 1890. Preparing a budget. The budget may or may not be a scorable criterion, but the reviewers will see it. It's a bit like in a courtroom, how many of you have been on jury duty? Okay. So sometimes in a courtroom, the judge will say, the jury will discount that statement because an objection has been sustained. But the jury already heard it. How could they completely reject it from their psychology? The budget goes in, whether it's a scorable criterion or not. So the reviewers see it, and they see if this person is being greedy, or there's no way that this instrument costs this amount of money. Personnel are the most expensive part of the budget. Enter your own salary into the grant, even if you don't plan on taking it. Because you will get dinged if you are putting time or effort into a proposal, but you don't have your summer month or your post, you know, all of your, I mean, obviously as a postdoc, you're going to put your postdoc salary in there, but those of you who go on further in academia or as a research scientist or, as, or a, a position that gets salary from grants, make sure to put that all in. Don't forget the common items like travel, publication fees, materials, recharge, and overhead. Overhead is the weird one. Overhead is like the tax that your institution charges on top of your direct costs. So if you need 100K at, in the UC system, you don't ask for 100K, you ask for 158K because we have the 58% overhead rate. That's money that pays for staff support, for the air conditioner, for um, for the facilities and so on. Usually your financial staff or, uh, will guide you or do it for you, like getting all the budget numbers to come out right, but it's important to know where all these numbers come from. And follow the uh, funder guidelines. Handling criticism and rejection. I can tell you that you don't get, you won't get 100% of the things that you don't apply for. And if you don't get rejected some of the time, you're not taking enough risks and or you're leaving money on the table. It's like how a hotel aims for 95% occupancy rate because if they had a 100% occupancy rate, they wouldn't know where the ceiling was. They wouldn't know how much they could be asking for. There would be people who would stay at the hotel who can't get in because it's booked and those people have money too. So if you don't apply for more stuff, and get rejected, you'll know that you're, you're, not, uh, you're not taking enough risks and you're leaving money on the table. Reviewers and program managers are not out to get you. They only have the budgets for 10 to 20% of proposals that get, subject, that get uh, accepted. Some criticism is highly unfair, and yes, that detail might be in there somewhere, but the reviewer just didn't find it. And that's like, it was right in there, I swear, I put that detail, see, see, and you show all your colleagues and friends. Like, see, it was, it was right in there, and they didn't see it. Oh, sorry. 
Um, however, you're getting a reaction from experts that you're not paying for. You're not paying their consulting rate. So a professor might charge a company like $200 an hour. Say it took three people three hours each to review your proposal. It's almost $2,000 in like pay foregone payment that you got that work from them for free. So take it for what it's worth. Resubmit, you have a couple of options. You can resubmit to the same agency if, you get, if it gets rejected after making revisions. But beware, usually the idea itself has to be revised, not just fixing the little nitpicks. Because a lot of times a reviewer will see an idea that doesn't like move them, and they're like, eh, I didn't find this to be that exciting, but I can't write that down as a criticism. So I'm going to give the whole litany of, oh, they're too far from their collaborator and the biostatistics and no, 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 no. And if you just fix all those, you're not solving the root problem. So you've got to do something, read between the lines and really crank up the uh, torque a little bit. And finally, no matter how good your idea, your preliminary data, the strength of your collaborations, grant writing is mediated by psychology, not always facts. It doesn't mean put wrong facts in there, but they have to be presented in a way that makes the reader feel smart, delighted. Grant writing is a necessary part of the process of research. Chat GPT is, as of now, not sophisticated enough to do a good job writing a grant. Well, it's probably pretty good at reviewing grants based on the quality of reviews that I've received in my life, but we won't go there. The, review, the reader is not going to read your mind. The reader is not going to study your figures or text. It has to be instantly understandable what you're talking about. The whole thing has to be in your face, transparent, what you're talking about. And if you focus on delighting the audience, not necessarily getting the funding, success will come on average. So thank you for allowing me to go over time. I'm happy to take questions, but after everyone gets pizza, thanks.